Hello, Alison. Hello, Penelope. <laughs> uh, I have to introduce you a little for those of our viewers who don't know you. So well, you were born in 1960. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you prefer to be called a writer, comic artist? Cartoonist. Cartoonist. That's what okay. we say in the U.S. Okay, because you know... What do you Fran call yourself? That's interesting because in French, uh, there's a bit of, uh, of a controversy. There has been a controversy oh. because the original word is auteur, although auteur implies oh. a male form. Right. So female authors have been struggling to have autrice, which you can hear. It means, it, it means author, but for a woman, mm -hmm. and you can hear it because otherwise, if you add an E at the end of auteur, you can read it, but you can't hear it. Right. So we really right. like to be called autrice, but surprisingly enough, it's uh, it has to be a struggle wow. because uh, some people are fighting back against that word. So you're a cartoonist and you are um, responsible for a number of books that include the series uh, Dykes to Watch Out For and Fun Home that we, we have I think all of your books here. Yeah. Are You My Mother in 2008, I think. And your most recent book that came out in France last month, uh, Le Secret de la Force Surhumaine, which is The Secret to Superhuman Strength. Yes. Yes. I read it in French, but no. So, um, disclaimer, I'm not a journalist. I have never <laughs> interviewed anyone in my life. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, so, because I'm an author too, I thought I'll just ask what's intriguing me yeah. and what I earnestly want to know about your work, what I'm curious of. And I'm also a huge fan. So that's kind of intimidating, but I'll do my best. Oh, don't be intimidated by okay. me. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> so first, a very plain question, but I have to ask, um, why the angle of sports to portray 60 years of your life and of writing as a background? You know, honestly, I... I sort of had run out of stories <laughs> after writing about my parents. I was trying to think, what else am I passionate about, passionate about in my life? And it was these athletic uh, pursuits. So I tried to figure out a way to make that into a book. And first I thought, oh, everyone likes sports. Everyone, you know, likes to exercise or, or would, would like to exercise. That's a good popular topic. Um, but the more I got into it, the more I realized I was interested in something deeper than just exercise. First, I thought it would be a, a quick, fun book <laughs> that I could do uh, fast, like in a year or two years. But it turned into a eight, nine year project as I started pursuing these other levels. It became a book about mortality and uh, why what's our purpose in life you know uh, and what does it mean to be creative and how do we sometimes i i have good creative uh flow sometimes i don't what determines that so i got interested in these other artists who also had periods of being stuck and being in the flow and just trying to figure something out about all of that stuff. So it took a lot longer. Yeah, longer than two years, I'm sure. Um, like you, I um, I love mountains and I cherish my cats, but above all, I, I write comics. <clears throat> and I also have a compulsive approach to sports. And um, it's the connection between these two practices that really fascinated me, the symmetry between creating and exercising. Wait, can I ask you about your compulsive relationship to sports? I started running just for fun, and I ran a marathon. Oh, wow. <laughs> I started yoga for fun, and I uh, became a teacher. Wow. That kind of That's hardcore. Compulsive. Yeah. Yes, because I need to do things for real. Yeah. So, yeah, that, I connected to some, wow. a lot of part of your books. And in sports and in writing, you need to confront to your own limitations um, and things that block you on the way, whether it's uh, injury or writer's block. And I also like the fact that you have this symmetry between the way you transcend these blockings, the way you, you deal with both of these blockings at different moments of your book. So Thank you. I, yeah, uh, That's a good way of putting it. Um, I wish I had been that clear about that theme. But yes, I think I like coming up against something, an obstacle, and then somehow getting past it. I think I also like... Uh, 
I like the feeling when I'm exercising of just coming up against physical limits, like, you know, the effort of breathing or the effort of climbing or the effort of lifting weights. I feel contained or almost held mm -hmm. by that encounter with the external world, I think, and I find it soothing, even though it's also very difficult. It's, all, it's comforting in some way. Yeah. I relate to that. Something that spoke to me greatly also is your, your will to regain spontaneity of reality. Again, that's the translation from the French version, I don't know. Without being paralyzed by the um, self-consciousness, like on a smooth ski slide, or when you finally get to draw uh, in an uncaring and, and free way. Yeah. And um, is it still a quest for you today? Yeah. I mean, I, it takes time and effort to get into that state. I can't just access it instantly, yeah. you know. Uh, so it took me a long time to, it was funny working on the book about that process while I was trying to have the process <laughs> of, of spontaneity and, and flow. Uh, is there a French equivalent for flow, uh, flow state? We, um... That the writing is, uh, we, we have fluid, which mm -hmm. means pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it's also very evocative to me when you mentioned um, the writing trance that you call the stressed felicity. I don't know. Again, I think it's uh, maybe it's the translation, but yeah, I'm not... it's um, a worried felicity, a moment of uh, oh. happiness, but that is still stress. Isn't it that, that state that we're trying to reach, the spirit of the beginner? Yeah, that we're always mind. trying yeah. to yeah. achieve. Yeah, I really like that. So, um, according to you, does running or riding a bike can be technically considered part of writing the book? Time that you work on the book. Yes, I, I consider it work, <laughs> writing. You yeah. know, um, and also I get many of my best ideas when I'm not at my desk or my drawing board, but moving, you know, running or, or biking. And I don't even bring a notebook with me when I'm out exercising because I feel like that will scare off the ideas. <laughs> I'll just, I just let them come. And it's a much more pleasant process than sitting in front of my computer trying to squeeze something out of my brain. Yeah, well, it makes sense. Philosophers were walking. And, I know, yeah. yeah. So many people have written so eloquently about walking and how that helps us to think. But then do you manage to remember your the ideas that you had? Sometimes I don't. And I just have to be okay with that. Or though I'll remember them later. But that's part of the whole trick. Like just let them come and go. Yeah. Um, oh, another thing that I thought was uh, great. You say that uh, the world is split into groups of people when facing the choice of eternally pedaling up a hill. <laughs> or uh, eternally going down the hill. What would you pick? I'm, your, I'm on your team. I'm on the control <laughs> team. But can you explain that a little more for... Um... Yes. If I had to choose between only riding uphill or only riding downhill, I would pick uphill because I had to think about this. Like, why? That's crazy. Why, not, why wouldn't you just want to coast downhill? As a child, the whole point was to go up so you could, you know, glide down. Um, But as an adult, I found that I, I love that long climb. I mean, it makes you go inward. It makes your mind go blank. There's something very transcendent about it. But also I realized it's about control and I have much more control going up where I'm just going very slowly. All I have to do is put in the effort. It's hard, but I know what I'm doing. Going downhill, anything could happen. You go around a curve, there's a a pothole or a truck coming and uh, it's very it's hard to really relax going downhill I, uh, ironically I find it easier to relax going uphill <laughs> yeah measured measured pain measured effort because yeah. I, I, I mean I understand control is uh, soothing um, another thing that has been a great source of reflection for me is your your dread to manage to finish a book and the way on your shoulder of the unfinished book whereas as you point out really correctly um, you are the only one who get to decide when is the end of the book what the book about and still we lose track of that and it feels like the decision is not ours and it becomes a dread 
Yeah. It was, I had been working on the book for a long time when I finally had that realization, like, I get to decide when this book is finished. And in fact, that moment, even though it was two years before I actually finished the book, <laughs> was sort of the um, end of the story, in a way, as I realized that nothing was going to descend from the heavens. I, I just had to make a choice. And also it was tied up for me. I had that realization on the day that some someone my age had just died. I just got the news that this woman had been killed in a bicycle accident. And, you know, that uh, got my attention. Like, life is short. And in a way, I, I was prolonging the end of the book because I somehow thought I would never die. <laughs> but realizing you are going to die, so you'd better finish this book uh, was very clarifying. Yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. Um, and freeing, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's no, it, it's not so bad to die, I guess. It's bad to die young, but we're all going to die at some point, so just accept it. Yeah, and let's keep that in mind while not finishing books. Yes. But it has to end at some point. Um, there, is, um, there is no such thing as comics writing for being in control of everything almost kind of in, a, of in a, a godly way. I, I know that's what I like about comics because you get to be everything, everyone, and uh, on your own, mm -hmm. which is also You're really... the director, the actor, the costumer. The, You're everyone. The animal wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and is that also something you like about writing comics? Yes. Control and yes. being uh, God? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, I noted that this time, and I think it's the first time you have not been working on your own on this book. That's true. So what does it change? Uh, yeah, I collaborated with my partner who helped, who did the coloring for the book. Um, and it was hard to let go of that control. Um, but I just didn't have time. Coloring is so time consuming. Do you, do you color your stuff? When yourself? I have time. Yeah. I don't know how people do it. It's a whole other job. Um, anyhow, Holly did the coloring and I would indicate to her what I wanted. You know, this should be blue, this should be red. Uh, but I really had to let her do her thing. <laughs> and it, we had some, some difficulties at the beginning. But then I, I was just so happy to have her helping and to have her engaged in the project with me. You know, in the, at the end of a book, you're just consumed by it. You're just living in that other realm. And I've always been in that place by myself. But this time I got to have a companion who really understood, like, this file has to go here and this, we need to print this out. And, you know, to be caught up in all the details the way I was, was, was nice. And so I can see the payoff of collaborating is you have, you have company. Plus, from what I understood, this was during lockdown. Oh, yeah. It all happened during the, that first year of COVID. So what else were we going to do? You know, it was perfect. That's a nice way to spend time together. I mean, yeah. working on the book. Um, and um, um, a few years ago, I wrote a, a, strip, a strip series in a weekly magazine about a center character. Her name was Josephine. And you have run a very, very long-term series for 25 years. And um, I wondered what were the, um, to you, the um, satisfactions and frustrations of having these people that you created living up to the point where they are actual people coexisting with you and they're so, they're existing for real in your mind and then one day they don't and do you yeah. sometimes miss Mo Lois and Sparrow? <laughs> uh, I, I, I didn't miss them at first because, as you probably know from doing a regular strip, it's exhausting, the constant deadlines, and you're always having to think of what comes next. Um, so for a long time I was fine, like, oh, I'm glad that's over, I can do something else. But uh, I did miss them at a certain point, especially when, uh, you know, 
politics in the U.S. took such a dark turn in 2016, I I did resurrect them a bit and yeah. did a few Extra like episodes special episodes. Reasons, yeah, right. yeah, just to check in with them and to see how they were doing. Um, and now I'm working on another project, a sort of auto-fictional book about me, but I'm making myself into a character like who's not who is me but is also <laughs> not me and my my friends are the dykes characters like we live in the same town and that's been really fun to play with and then i, I get to uh, spend more time with them maybe that's the uh, next level and the ideal way to do it auto fiction but kind of disguised as this is not me yeah yeah i've always been very much a purist about memoir like i will tell the absolute truth i'm going to work really hard to excavate my soul. But when I thought about doing that yet again after finishing this book, um, well, all three of these books about everything in my life, it didn't seem fun. It seemed more fun to just make stuff up. So I, I guess I'm, it's, it's like getting back to my comic strip roots where I get to write about a fictional world. And you're already working on this? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Not drawing it yet, but writing. Mm -hmm. Can't wait. Do you write and draw at the same time? Or do you, how do you, everyone always asks me that and I, <laughs> I don't know what to t tell them. It's kind of a weird mixture of, uh, it's almost hier hieroglyphs, like it's kind of word that are, you have arrows and, and kind of little stickmen and words and no one can understand my, my first draft. It's a... Uh, Do you do it all in pencil, like on, in a notebook, or yeah, and then afterwards on iPad? Because oh, you draw on, on the yeah, iPad because it's really like pencil, but way more convenient than pencil. I know. I wish I could do that. I never. I'm too old. I didn't quite make it into the no. that uh, no, no, I, drawing I on the screen. You can start that anytime. I'm sure. <laughs> you just really have to. <laughs> um, Another thing you said that really made me laugh is that you said that being raised a Catholic implies a natural ease for confession. Yes. But I'm wondering, because of because you put so much of yourself in your books, um, does it make it easier for you to talk about it afterwards, like in like promoting them in interviews? Or on the contrary, the fact that you you put so much in your book is you've said it all and you don't want <laughs> you're tired of talking about Sometimes I feel that way, like uh, people will at press me for more personal information and I'm like, haven't I given you enough? Uh, just leave me alone. I, it's funny, I feel like in the books I, I am very, I'm, I'm an exhibitionist, but I'm not really like that in person. I don't mind writing about it, but I'd rather not talk about it if I don't have to. Yeah, that, yeah, that can be exhausting, I guess, talking about you talking about yourself. Yeah, and I, I always try to find ways to make turn it back to the writing and the you know the creation, but people are so curious about yeah personal. I mean, I am. I want to know the author's personal secrets, so I understand that urge. But I try to deflect it a little bit if I can. Yeah, would you like to be able to just drop your book and never talk about it or promote it or? You know, I kind of would. I shouldn't say that, but. Yeah. We all do, I guess. I, you know, I, I envy authors from a hundred years ago who didn't have to, you know, be on Twitter and do television interviews. <laughs> Imagine Virginia Woolf having to go out and do this kind of thing. <laughs> That would not be good. <laughs> um, yes, and, and because you, that was the other part of my question, because you describe so accurately your thoughts and your feelings, inevitably your readers feel a very intimate connection to you. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, do you meet your readers a lot? You know what, Penelope, as you were saying that, I, I was revising what I just said, and I, I do love meeting the readers. I mean, I work... Not, not the journalists, <laughs> just, <laughs> just the readers. <laughs> Except for you. Um, I know you're not really a journalist. That, that's why. That's a trick. <laughs> right. Um, You know, I work in solitude for so long on these things, and who knows who's reading them or responding to them. So it means a lot to meet the readers. And when this when this book came out, it's it was still lockdown, so I I didn't do a tour in the U.S. for that book, and it was 
it was sad. I was relieved not to have to travel, you know, to fly all over the place, but I was very sorry to not meet people. I did Zoom things on the computer, but they were very just sort of dull and flat because there's no response from anyone. It's just me talking. Who knows who's listening? So it made me realize I do very much value that interaction. Yeah. And it's sort of the finish line validation yeah. to have people tell you. I really like, by the way, that scene. I think it's in this one. Yeah. Wait, where you're, in, you're at a con and uh, somebody's oh, yeah. raising a hand and says, isn't it, are, aren't you nervous to make a sequel to Fun Home? <laughs> and I thought this must have happened for real maybe a million times. It, it did happen right after Fun Home came out when I was trying to start my next project and didn't have a clear idea of what it was going to be. And that question really terrified me and just hung over me for years. <laughs> yes. And what do, what do they usually tell you, your readers? Well, a lot of people tell me that, that the books have helped them. I, I feel sheepish even admitting this, but it's very touching. Maybe they're making it up. Maybe they feel compelled just to say something when they're standing in line for me to, you know, sign their book. And they, they have to say something flattering, but they seem genuine often, mm -hmm. like that it, it helped them or changed them. And that's amazing. Yeah, that's a great reward. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure they mean it, honestly, because uh, that kind of happened to me also with your book. So, um, yeah, y you've been awarded the most prestigious prizes you can imagine, the MacArthur Genius Award, which I thought is really <laughs> cool. You're a member of the uh, Eisner Hall of Fame, yeah. you name it, uh, um, among many prizes and awards. So I was wondering, after a while, after a successful career like yours, not after, but <laughs> with a successful career like yours, what do awards still mean? And, and do they mean something still? Do they change something? You know, it's funny, and this is a terrible thing to confess, but once I achieve something, I'm published in this magazine or I win this award, I'm like Groucho Marx. It's like, well, that club must must not have been very good if they let me in. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately start to kind of devalue it in a way. Eisner I'm crazy. Hall of Fame. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's an insult to the Eisner Hall of Fame. How can anyone say such a thing? But that's what happens in my brain. And then I have to struggle. No, look, it's, it's real. Look at all, the, all these other people. You've got to like uh, accept this. And I know it's such a typically feminine response, that whole, um, uh, what do we call it? Uh, fraud, you think you're a fraud? Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. I, I wish I could get that out of my system. But, but it doesn't help? to fight the imposter syndrome, to think I've, I've ticked all the boxes? It helps a little bit, but I still keep thinking they must have made a mistake. I'm sorry to tell you this. It's terrible. It's a terrible confession. One day, I hope to just be able to embrace all that and feel, yes, yes, I am a MacArthur fellow. <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of reassuring to know that it's not a matter of uh, the amount of awards or time. It's just... You have to accept and accept that you'll never feel uh, legit. Well, also the other thing is, I, I think on some level I believe that it's my eternal striving and you know feeling not good enough that gets me those things. So therefore, I have to keep keep feeling illegitimate. Yeah, that's a great fuel. Yeah, undermining yourself is really a good yeah. fuel. Not great for your happiness, but good for your <laughs> achievement. Yes. <laughs> Um, and, um, well, comic artists sometimes see their work adapted to TV or movies, but I think that I know of you're the only member of the very selective club of, uh, authors who've been adapted to Broadway musicals <laughs> and in a very, very successful way too. I've seen it. In, oh, did you? Yes. In 2015. And I really loved that's a, that's fun home that has been adapted to yeah. Broadway in 2013. And you know, at first sight, it may seem a very uh, odd way to adapt the themes that are uh, born in, in Fun Home. What was your first reaction when offered this or your fears? or it, it seemed crazy to me. I could not imagine how they would make a musical out of this book. And I think 
I secretly hoped they would try and not be able to do it. And then I could just collect the option money <laughs> and there would be no product. Um, but I was very amazed to see what they actually made, to see what the creators made out of my book. Um, it, you know, I didn't know much about musicals. I'm not really a musical, you know, it's a whole culture. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't part of it, but uh, I'm really glad I did it. It brought the story to such a much broader audience. Uh, and they did a, a great job. I found it very moving. <laughs> Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, there's a reason why it was so successful. Not just the book, the original book, but the way they put it, I thought was really amazing. Yeah, they the did. The songs were great. I know, the songs were great. <laughs> uh, and they, they created like a, a separate, as an adaptation, so many adaptations are not good. There's always something wrong or missing. But I feel like they captured the essence of the book in their own way, in their own medium. They recreated everything. They didn't just try and translate it. They remade it, you know. Did you collaborate? With them? No, no, no. I had to just trust them, and it was it was it worked out. I, I read somewhere. I don't know if it's true that it was pretty much the first time that a um, fe female only team of Broadway creators were awarded a, a Tony Award. Yes, that's true. So it was very nice to be part of that yeah. historic moment too. Of course, and yeah. um, are there any uh, adaptation offers that you've turned down in the past? Well, early on there was a, a film offer for Fun Home, which I, I didn't turn down, but I asked for more money. <laughs> I decided how, I, I knew it would be bad to have a bad movie made of this very intimate story. So I had to decide how much was my soul worth. <laughs> And I would ask them for that much money. Yeah, I think it was my soul at that point was worth fifty thousand dollars, and they said no. So. Oh, <laughs> that's a very affordable soul. <laughs> well, it was a long time ago. Oh, um, okay. But if you and if that would happen, would you need to interfere because it's your own story, or would you be letting go and let them do whatever they want? I think in that case, it was it. It was I would have to let go and. I, that would have been hard because I don't know movies a movie seemed much more similar or at least a familiar medium to me more than a musical I was it was easier to let go of that when I thought about a musical yeah no, I would want to see who's playing me who's playing my mom who's <laughs> I'll be controlling everything for me well I did know who the writer would be uh, and it was Lisa Crone uh, oh. uh, a playwright who I had known a long time and who I really respected. So it was on the strength of that that I said yes to the deal. So another club you belong to, this one is not so joyous, is the um, club of uh, band books in the U.S. And yes. um, Fun Home has been, uh, where it has been attempted to be censored uh, several times um, in 2006, 2008, 2014. Uh, from city libraries to uh, budget cuts in a uh, university in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a bit more about this and how it affected you? Yeah, it was interesting. All of a sudden, these book, this book about my life was being banned or called obscene, which just felt <laughs> so preposterous. How can you say my, my life is obscene? You know, I'm, I'm showing you this intimate material and uh, but people are people in the United States are crazy uh, and in fact this ban there's a just a frenzy of book banning going on in recent years since Trump was elected and people have become so much more polarized school boards are you know getting upset about any book that talks about race in any kind of an honest way talking about slavery in any kind of honest way Books about gender and sexuality just completely freak them out. So a lot of books are being banned recently. Um, and it's very disturbing, you know? Uh, I don't know what to do about, <laughs> do about it. Uh, in, in the past, the, there were a few, um, you know, separ separate incidents several years apart. And I was just like, well, okay, you, 
you will increase my book sales by calling attention to my book. Thank you. But I tried otherwise not to spend much time on it or energy. Um, and many of those earlier cases got resolved. Like, you know, they decided, yes, this is okay to keep in the library. That's fine. It's okay to teach this at the school. But now, um, the, all these new cases, it's, it's just crazy what's going on. My book, along with many other books, is being banned. And even uh, some crazy guy had a book burning, some pastor in, in the South. I think he was mostly burning Harry Potter books, though. Oh, because <laughs> the, of the witchcraft. Yeah. yeah, I heard that. But it's just a very strange atmosphere, uh, you know, as if people have learned nothing from history. And in fact, I don't think they know any history, you yeah. know? That may be part of the problem. And um, I remember uh, the uh, the work of the um, um, uh, CBLDF? CLDF? Yes, yeah. Comic Book Legal, Legal Defense yes, Fund. Yes, yeah. Were you in, in touch with them for the... For yes. To fight back. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I support them, and um, they have done amazing work on behalf of my book and many, many other comics. It's funny because comics are a bit of a special case. They get a little more scrutinized at schools because they're pictures. And, and that there's an assumption that that's going to be more, I don't know, dangerous for kids. They'll be drawn into these subversive books because they have funny pictures. Yeah, I remember having to redraw some of the pages of my comics really uh, for certain states wow yes and also because there was a there's a portrait of a woman who had been an activist for abortion and it also was kind of an issue for schools because wow. it was tar it was targeting a younger audience and there was a bit of an issue around abortion so i remember that you redrew it for the u.s, the US. translation yeah. oh my god that's so nipples. barbaric cover nipples i had to cover <gasps> nipples there's a story of Josephine Baker, and I had to cover her nipples. <laughs> and also I had to remove a, a... There was a scene with a, a guy with an, an erection under a bed sheet, and I had to um, oh, so remove, <laughs> remove the little tent. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and in the background of The Secret to Superhuman Strength, uh, we see the political evolutions of your country, mostly through a TV set. Yeah. And uh, we see you uh, going through glimpses of hope, catastrophes, ups and downs, Donald Trump, uh, being uh, sometimes resigned, sometimes wearing a pink hat, sometimes just simply madly angry. So I was wondering how does um, uh, political rage age? Um, how do you, today, how do you cope with that rage? Um, I'm trying to put it into my work. I'm not great at being an activist. I'm not a natural street activist. Plus I live in the woods, so what, what am I going to do? Go out in the woods with my sign? <laughs> um, but for many years, when I wrote my comic strip, when I wrote Dykes to Watch Out For, it was a, a forum for me to vent all my feelings and thoughts about what was going on in the world. And I'm trying to do that now in this new book that I'm writing, my, my autofiction. It's also very true. It's very much about living in the world at this bizarre moment. And, you know, just talking about the news as it comes up, uh, I'm hoping that it will be at, at least uh, some kind of companionship for all mm -hmm. the other people who are living through this and feeling, you know, insane. Yeah, and I mean, just mentioning some issues in books is political. I mean, in your books are political and a part of activism anyway. Like. I mean, you, you, you draw strips about menopause. That's political. <laughs> I remember, you know, I met Joyce Farmer a few years ago. Oh, wow. And I remember a conversation where she said uh, that her and their group of uh, fellow women authors in comics a little while ago, they were activists because they were the first people to put a tampon in comics. Wow. And that was... Even that was a threat to society back then. Uh, and, yeah. and so I think your work, your work is immensely activist and political. Well, when I was young and just starting out, it felt like, yeah, just writing about being a lesbian, whether it was overtly political or not, was a political act because no one was 
seeing seeing that or mm. doing that openly. So, yeah. Or just, you know, just going out on the street and with your little lesbian badge on that was political. <laughs> I think it is still today. Um, they're disrupting. I think um, because the. Uh, they give a voice to stories that are not often heard and that part of the world doesn't want to hear uh, women, lesbian stories. That's uh, something that, um, yeah, a large part of the world wants to silence that. Yeah. And um, because... I, re- I thought we were making progress, though. You know, I really thought we were moving forward. And now now we've, we're just moving backward into the past. It's very distressing. Yes, yes, it is. It's, uh, it's su- super depressing. And I think, uh, I mean, what do you think the comics, which part do you think they have to play in this? Um, in the current moment? Yes. Uh, I know it's a super wide question. But... I don't know, because I, I sometimes wonder if it changes anything. You know, there was so much great political humor in the U.S. in, in the years building up to Trump and in the, in the, through the Trump administration. Uh, I can't now. I can't think of anyone's names. Samantha B. and John Oliver. All these great um, comedians doing very insightful political humor. But did that stop anything? No, no. These uh, these people who want to take America back to some fictitious past just got more uh, powerful. So sometimes I wonder what it does. Did humor stop the Nazis? No, there, and there was a lot of subversive humor in that era too. Um, I think we just have to think of it differently. The humor does something, but it it uh, it doesn't do what we always hope it will. I yep. know it's very depressing. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm depressed. I don't, I don't need. I don't don't worry. <laughs> uh, but um, I think uh, showing people showing people can lead the way for other people who read your books. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Alice Coffin. She's a French mm. journalist and activist and political figure. And she has a book and a theory called The, the Lesbian Genius. Oh. And uh, she analyzes the mechanisms that made invisible in the public landscape for so long lesbians, whereas uh, at the same time, they their contribution has been so important. Mm-hmm. And um, why why do you think even today um, there is um, how do you explain there is a, such a scarce and not so great representation of lesbians in mainstream fiction? Um, Although it's getting a little better, but still a little better. Um, the author Sarah Schulman ha- has spoken very eloquently about this phenomenon for years and um, she she wrote a little treatise called lesbian content the kiss of death <laughs> and as far as fiction goes and I don't know I mean I think if it's if it's a lesbian protagonist in a story there's probably not I mean there might be men in the story but it's not a story for men or or, I mean, of course it is. All these stories are for everyone. But the perception is you have to sell stuff to men because men have money and they're the ones who are going to buy the books. Uh, so you have to, you know, include men in some way. Uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, that was my, like, early feminist argument. I feel like surely we should have evolved further than this by now. But I, I think, in general, people still haven't realized that women have interesting universal stories, too. Honestly, if, if Fun Home, if this book had been not about my gay father, but about my lesbian mother, I don't think it would have had nearly as much attention, you know? It certainly wouldn't have been turned into a Broadway musical. <laughs> oh, but that's a, that's a very uh, good point. And, um, Nobody really wants to hear about women. That's the sad truth. Yes, w- because... women do increasingly, and hopefully, men will will get on board. But it's still a struggle. Yes, because it's not considered neutral. Yeah, and universal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's perceived as somehow po- polemical <laughs> or, or niche. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yes, and it's just half of humanity, so it's kind of a large niche. But yeah. 
Do you remember the first uh, fictional female character that you thought maybe not I relate or identify, but at least she's kind of cool? Harriet the Spy, in the, a, a children's book by Louise Fitzhugh. Um, it's a wonderful book about a little girl who she who is a she has a spy route. She goes and spies on her neighbors and takes notes on them in her her notebook. Um, and it's about becoming a, a writer, hmm. and that was my first heroine. How old were you? Oh, eight. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're here to talk about pop culture, and of course, one of your most famous additions to it is the test that bears your name. Um, I'll quickly uh, remind people what it is. It's a test that measures the uh, female representation in a work of fiction by checking if at least two female characters are part of it, uh, speak together, and not about the hero, not about men, and they have to have names? Someone else added that name part. Okay. For me, you don't have to have names. Okay. Not even. <laughs> yeah. You don't even have to have names. <laughs> Just exist. Yes. Um, so that test has been used over and over again, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so accurate ways, I think. But in 2022, today, are there any other boxes to tick that you would add or change or modify to force the industry to do better? Do you have other criteria today? Um, <clears throat> I like to keep it simple. Uh, I think the simpler, the more likely it is to be followed. And of course, I never set out to make this some kind of universal standard. It was a joke. It was a yeah. joke in a comic strip that I wrote when I was 25, like eons ago. Um, but somehow it's gotten re rediscovered and recirculated in the culture, which is very cool to me that that happened. Um, no, I wouldn't change it. I'd keep it short and sweet. Yeah, I think it still works pretty well. Um, totally different subject. N not so different, but um, you fell in the vortex of training and working out uh, because as a child you dreamt of the strength of a Charles Atlas or Rocky. And uh, recently, Serena Williams has retired after decades of probably being the greatest champion uh, of her time and also a model of strength. Yeah. And which has earned her a number of uh, misogynistic attacks precisely for this, at yeah. least a lot in France, about her looks. And I thought, what has it changed and how would it would have been different for you if you had female oh, wow. super if I had strength grown up? heroes to look up to as role models? My entire life would have been different if I had seen Serena Williams as a child. What an amazing phenomenon she is and, and has, what she's done for women in sports, it's, it's un unfathomable, it's huge. Um, yeah, and she fought against so much, so many racist and misogynistic attacks for so long. And it's so great now to see, to see men and little boys like in awe of her. Uh, that makes me so happy. Yeah, the fact that she's not the best woman, but the best. Yes. Period. And uh, the goat, the greatest of all yes. time. Yes, she's really. Uh, yes, I'm really happy that she's part of the world that the gen these generations are growing up with. Yeah. She she exists. She's something. That's, yeah. Uh, um, you said it in your book. Sorry, I quote you a lot, but I really <laughs> like that one. I didn't notice the condescending tone. Ordinary misogyny was the air I was breathing. I thought that was really brilliant. So what, what has changed uh, that in your life? I mean, how, how collectively do we start noticing the air? How do we... I'm, make, I'm making it more specific. I'm sure there is not a moment when you started noticing it, but how do you explain? What are the events along your life that, you know, bit by bit made you noticing? Um, first of all, I want to say it has changed enormously since I was a child. When I was a kid, women were just the butt of jokes. They were dumb and ditzy and certainly didn't, were not the central characters in anything. Um, and they were all, all were drawn, in, if, if you were looking at the comics, they were all drawn in this very sexual way, sexualized, uh, you know, with gigantic breasts and big poofy hair. Um, so that has that has all changed. Um, but when did I, it's hard to th think as, 
what the steps were of really noticing it and noticing it change. I mean, I lived through the women's liberation movement. As a child, I started hearing about these women who were burning their bras uh, and demanding their rights. And it was all, you know, people were making fun of them. And I started thinking, wow, that's, that sounds interesting. Uh, I like those women. <laughs> uh, so I was, you know, I was young. I was t 10, 11, 12 when I started hearing about actual women's liberation. And, um, but it wasn't really, honestly, it wasn't until I came out as a lesbian, until I realized I was a lesbian. Oh, sorry, tapping my microphone. Um, that I became a feminist. You know, I mean, I was, I was perhaps an instinctual feminist before that, but when I started to see, when I found myself on the outside as a lesbian, it helped me to see all the other people on the outside, you know, women, people of color, this whole like tilted playing field. So coming out for me was very much also a political awakening. And that's when I started to really understand feminism, when I began taking it personally. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm thinking at the same time. Do you, um, do you, what, what do you think today of the, uh, a word that means so many things and again, that has changed meanings. What do you think of the word sorority today? What, what does it evoke to you? Do you believe in that? Sisterhood, as we would say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I believe in that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all, it's more, much more complicated yeah. these days as our understanding of gender has evolved, like who counts as a sister. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's, solidarity is, is always a good thing. Um, and we need more of it. Yeah. Because right, right now in France, there are a lot of, uh, frictions inside under the, the umbrella word, uh, sisterhood. And exactly like you pointed out, who do you call a sister and, um, inside our own, um, group, there are tensions um that are um that 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 prevent us from being united under yeah and um so i was i was thinking that this word is very convenient to hide some dust under the rug and um so i just i was just curious what you thought of the word because we've heard it a lot um so um well i think the more inclusive the sorority can be the better yes um I also think that um, a very uh, interested question and very self-centered, uh, but what would you say to the 40 year old writer that you were to make it easier for her on the way? Uh, I wouldn't say anything because then she would slack off and she wouldn't do anything. I would say, keep working, keep working or something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very um, inspired and admiring um, an enthusiast of the um, freedom and inventiveness of the work of very young female cartoonists yeah. these days. Um, and I was wondering, what's your take on the younger generation of uh, female cartoonists? I am so delighted to see so much brilliant work coming from these young women. You know, just not having any of the self-doubt or questioning that I did as a young, as a young woman. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. I, I'm a little envious of them. <laughs> yes. Because also you're a reference to them. And it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's like a this cycle of mutual, um, inspiration, I think. It's funny to think of that. It's very funny to find myself like an, an elder statesman, you know, in this world, but at, at the Nancy Festival, where I was the other day, several young women cartoonists came up to me and thanked me for my work and said how much it had influenced them. And I'm like, wow, really? Uh, it's, it's wild to find yourself old. <laughs> well, I'm not a young cartoonist, but you surely are very, very important in my uh, oh, Penelope, writing process. Thank you. Thank really. you. 
but I promised I wouldn't fangirl, so okay. I won't. Um, and speaking of these young, younger artists, have you ever considered teaching? Uh, I'm not a great teacher. I've done a little bit of some workshops here and there, but I'm much too selfish and self-absorbed. <laughs> I just want to do my own work. Yeah. Have you taught? No, but I'm I'm thinking of it all the time because really? I'm thinking like an old vampire. This would be a nice way to, to stay in Get, touch with youth. Yeah. And, yes. uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it must be very gratifying too, and very to 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 help someone. You know, uh, I don't know, giving birth to something and thinking like kind of a pep talking them, and but maybe I have a very fake idea of what it's like to teach. Maybe I don't know. But at some point, one day, maybe. Did you study comics? Was that a thing when you were? I, w I went to art art college, but mm -hmm. it wasn't about comics. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I, and I had a few teachers that were very important to me on the way, mostly because they were pepping me, like saying, "Yeah, you can do it. Don't don't listen to haters." And that's all they did, and it was wow. all I needed. So I think I can do that. <laughs> Cool. But it is a lot of time and energy, and you have to be willing to commit completely. So. Yeah, I, I, I would miss... I, I also, I'm an introvert, and teaching, you've got to be putting out so much energy for other people. I just don't think I'd be good at it. Okay. And finally, I have to ask you the three ritual questions of the Pop Women Festival. They have three ritual okay. questions. All right. What does pop culture evoke to you? <laughs> When I think of pop culture, I think of how uh, this is this is the first thing that comes to my mind, and it's very a very eccentric thing. But when I was a teenager, I I was I was a nerd. I was a I was not one of the cool kids. I didn't know. I, I just didn't have that pop culture vibe, and I had to train myself to listen to the radio, to learn the songs that everyone was listening to because it, it didn't come naturally to me so i had to study pop culture even at a young age which is funny because i you know i know i work in a popular medium i love the fact that comics is is pop culture but at the same time i'm a little bit out of it yeah that is probably the most popular art form comics i mean you are in the center of pop culture I know. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, is there a female artist, writer, personality you'd like us to discover? Hmm. Um, oh, rediscover. Who, who hasn't been discovered? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, well, this this woman who I wrote about in in my book, one of the many writers in the Secret to Superhuman Strength, is an American transcendentalist thinker named Margaret Fuller. And she is an absolute rock star heroine. Came out of the, you know, the darkest depths of the 19th century to become a journalist. She traveled to Europe. She became a war correspondent. She took a lover. She had a baby with him. She had this crazy revolutionary life in the mid 1900s. Um, 1800s, sorry. <laughs> um, and I would love to see a miniseries or a movie about this woman. She got a very bad rap from history. I think as a, you know, a smart activist, progressive woman, people just didn't want to take her seriously. But it's, I think it's time for her to get a closer look. Okay. And um, is there an artist uh, or writer? you'd love to work with, or just, let's just say, have coffee with, living or dead? Well, I think, as, as we've discussed, I'm not a great fan of collaboration, but <laughs> if I had to collaborate with someone, I would love to do a graphic novel with Colette about her music hall days. I think that would be a really fun project. Her musical days? Her, she worked in the music hall, like, ah, you know, per okay. performing, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, would, I would buy that immediately. I think she might be very bossy, though, telling me exactly what to draw. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> But that would be great, uh, a great book cover, I think. Um, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Penelope, thank you. That This was, was a my uh, first interview. And, uh, and that was uh, the best uh, 
person to interview, I can imagine. So thank you so much. Thank you. And again, congratulations on, on this book. Oh, I, I read that it, it's the last part of a trilogy, is it? Do you consider it a trilogy? I didn't think of it that way, but other people have made that observation and I'm like, okay, okay, there's three of them, sure. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.